Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the last uh, event in today's conference. Some of you I know have been here uh, this afternoon, um, which is a celebration uh, of the uh, life in letters, as it were, of Richard Sennett and his retirement for the school. Usually people don't get this honour until they're dead. Um, uh, Richard's not looking too well, but he is nonetheless, nonetheless still, uh, still alive. I have a right At least, yes. Uh, and so uh, if anything does go wrong, we have got uh, what is necessary. Um, <laughs> So I find myself uh, uncomfortably positioned uh, between the godly and the unholy uh, this, uh, this evening. Uh, but it is an enormous uh, pleasure for us, an enormous privilege for the school, uh, to have the Archbishop with us uh, this evening. Um, I discovered, since I like this kind of uh, trivia, uh, that he's curiously 11th in order of precedence in this country. One behind Prince Michael of Kent. <laughs> and, and one above, Kenneth Clark, <laughs> uh, who has achieved this eminence now through becoming Lord Chancellor, which is a sort of grace and favour title these days, uh, but which still appears in the Order of Presidents. Uh, but the Archbishop was a Professor of Divinity at Oxford, so can claim to be an academic of sorts. It's, uh, <laughs> it's only Oxford. Um, he's um, <laughs> The 104th uh, Archbishop of Canterbury uh, is also a poet and a translator of poetry. Uh, and it says uh, in Wikipedia, which is almost certainly wrong, that he speaks or reads 11 languages. I'm always a bit doubtful about that. But the one thing we know at the LSE is that any LSE audience does include people who speak almost all languages. So I'm hoping that in the questions you'll test him. Uh, <laughs> on one of these uh, 11. Uh, but he's also a literary critic of great distinction and wrote a fascinating book on Dostoevsky uh, recently. He has not, however, uh, so far, as I am aware, written a book of literary criticism on the novels of Richard Sennett. <laughs> I first encountered Richard's writings in 1986, 82, sorry, when... I actually reviewed one of his novels uh, called The Frog Who Dared to Croak, which was the first of a series of three novels. Maybe he's written more, but the others have not got into press. Um, luckily for our relationship when I came to the school to be his boss, this review has been lost uh, to public view um, because it was pre-internet days and was for a journal which has since become defunct. And so the fact that the text of this review, of which I have some vague recollection, but the fact that that text has not reappeared has avoided some considerable embarrassment for both of us. Um, but since this early flirtation with the novel form, Richard's written mainly, of course, on sociology, and particularly the sociology of cities. Uh, and the next book I've his I read was Flesh and Stone, which I enjoyed much more than the Frog Book. Um, more recently, The Craftsman, of course, has been extremely well-reviewed, uh, and his final book, however, is How I Write the Sociology as Literature, which I think is a perhaps slightly risky harking back to his career as a novelist. But this evening, both of them are going to talk on narrative and Ritual. Richard will speak first and the Archbishop will respond, which means that Richard must be at least number 10 in the order of precedence <laughs> in uh, this country. Uh, then we will have a little bit of discussion between the two and uh, in the last 20 minutes or so we'll open it out to you. So without further ado, Richard. Thank you very much. I want to see that review. <laughs> Sounds very ominous. 
Of course, I'm uh, sad to leave the London School of Economics after 13 years here, but I'm equally glad uh, to be here with you tonight. Uh, when my mother worked in London just after the Second World War, she found you Brits to be remarkably open and welcoming, and so you proved several decades later uh, to my family and to me. I made many friends at the school, as in my adopted country. I've had the satisfaction of helping create the school's cities program. And Ricky Burdett and I could have only done this thanks to the former director of the school, Anthony Giddens, its present director, Howard Davies, and our academic colleagues. Um, by temperament, I'm something of an oyster, despite the fact that I, go out, I seem to go out to dinner quite a bit. I like to dig in and stay put intellectually. And uh, I owe to my wonderful students here uh, many occasions in which I've been dug out. Uh, this afternoon's events prompted in me the desire to argue with each speaker, preferably with a glass of something cold in hand and with something to smoke. Since the ominous regime of health and safety forbids these physical pleasures, I can only thank the organizers of these events, Judy Weissman and Saskia Sassen. Uh, they put enormous effort into bringing us uh, together today. I should perhaps add that I'm not quite leaving the LSE uh, since I'll keep a connection to the city's program. And should you find yourself in need of a smoky, boozy, talky afternoon, you'll find me at Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, you can smoke in rooms there. It's heaven. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this evening, Archbishop Rowan Williams and I are going to talk about an impossibly large issue which passionately concerns us both. We are asking what binds the human community together culturally. And we're exploring two ingredients in the recipe for that cultural glue, ritual and narrative. Without shared rituals and narratives, society has no purpose. The everyday relations between human beings risk falling apart. And yet modern society courts just that risk. Cultural glue of shared ritual and narrative is weakening. In his recent book on Dostoevsky, Rowan Williams has been exploring the intimate bond between narrating and believing. Russians have rightly received this work as Velikaya uh, Kniga, which means a magisterial book. Williams shows how storytelling bonds us to one another and inexorably more bonds us to a realm beyond ourselves. I'm going to focus on the prosaic everyday rituals which could and should bind people together outside the family, the circle of close friends, rituals among strangers, that is to say, rituals in the public realm. A ritual has three essential elements. The first is repetition. Ritual activities are behaviors which can be repeated again and again. But unlike mechanical repeats, where we gradually get bored by doing the same thing again and again. Rituals do not stale. Each time we use the same formulas of comfort, enquiry, exchange, of self-expression, the gestures have value. Ritual renews. It combines repetition with presence. The reason for this is that rituals, secondly, transform physical stuff, bodily movements, or bland words, into symbols. Such transforming work we know immediately in religious rituals, like the bread and wine of the Eucharist, or the food at a Seder. These become more than physical substances to eat and drink. Secular, symbolic transformations occur equally on the street as in making eye contact with strangers, 
by briefly glancing at one another, at another person, rather than staring. We send the symbol that we mean no harm. Ritual is thus a work of metamorphosis, making the material other than itself, and yet this symbol is always renewed and refreshed by repetition. Finally, ritual is theatrical, and this is less obvious than it may seem. A good professional actor speaks his or her lines night after night without going stale, or makes the smallest glance speak volumes. Many years of training are required to bring this off, and the actor's rock is a set text not of his or her own making. Everyday rituals have a different character. They have to be accessible and easy to learn so that everybody can participate. More the text for real world ritual is tradition, but traditions, as Eric Hobsbawm and Benedict Anderson caution us, are inventions, often unstable or contested. Over the course of time, participants become thus authors as well as actors. Still, the participant in any real world ritual is performing. This is a matter of seeking to communicate expressively to others, which is perhaps the most important thing about ritual. It obliges us to turn outward towards others to express something which is not ourselves. It stands at the opposite pole from a person lost in the labyrinth of his or her own private feelings. When I first started writing about public life, I focused on the city as a stage for these expressive performances. I started the uses of disorder with a fundamental fact about cities. They concentrate in the same place people who are different. To connect to strangers, urbanites need to learn how to deal with difference. My view was and is that they need performing skills to express themselves to people they do not know and who do not know them. This approach is what's called, academics always do this, this approach is what's called the dramaturgical school of analyzing the public realm. School formed by the anthropologists Clifford Geertz and Victor Turner, the sociologists Irving Goffman and myself. It contrasts to views of the public realm put forward by Hannah Arendt, my teacher, who stressed deliberation in public, and again contrasts to Jürgen Habermas's idea of the public realm, which has come to stress consensus building. We focused on culture, they on politics. In the fall of public man, I traced the gradual erosion of urban expressive behavior in Paris, London, and New York from the 18th century up to the present. The culture of big Western cities has made it ever harder, I think, for strangers to behave expressively to one another on the street. This loss of a public stage has driven people within themselves searching for subjective truth at the expense of social bonds. In Flesh and Stone, which I think is my best book, and of course, which I suffered over the most, I sought to understand a longer struggle in Western culture about the second element of ritual, bodily gesture and symbol making. Sym symbolic metamorphosis of the physical has proved singularly fragile in our civilization. Finally, in the conscience of the eye, I've explored ways in which architectural design and urban planning might stimulate people to contrive and to act out those ritual bonds which bind strangers together. I'm something of a physical determinist. I believe uh, environmental design profoundly shapes culture, and I particularly explored how the boundaries and borders between different uh, immigrant communities or different social classes or different religions might become sites for renewed civic engagement. But this kind of work 
city forum for public life is necessarily incomplete, or at least I found it so. I hadn't accounted capitalism's role in weakening the tissues of ritual connection. As a good socialist, this was a grievous failure on my part. The opposition of capitalism to bonding civic rituals is something that's really obsessed me in the last decade. It's what I've done with my anger about uh, bankers. From its origins, industrial capitalism has offered little in the way of shared civic culture. For all the reasons obvious to you at the LSE, in this august Fabian institution. Inequality divides, social mobility abandons others, greed individualizes. These are the classic cultural poisons of capitalism. But in recent decades, a new poison has been added, one which concerns time. We think rightly of modern capitalism as orientated to the short term. This means on the side of capital, short-term investment rather than long-term ownership. On the side of management, it means running institutions which have a chameleon character, changing focus and business plans to suit what the economist Bennett Harrison once called impatient global capital. On the side of labor, it means the replacement of long-term careers by short-term jobs. A consultant who moves constantly, who belongs to no one organization, who feels no loyalty, has become the role model for the new kind of work. During the heady days of the long boom of the 1980s, 1990s and 2000s, the promise short-term capitalism made to its ordinary workers was freedom. Freedom from the chains of bureaucracy, entrepreneurial freedom. As I was to find in my researches, however, the result, the reality, is quite different. Short-term, flexible work inhibits strategic planning and deprives people of a narrative for their labors. Confusions I traced in the corrosion of character among middle-level uh, tech workers and professional services. Institutions run on a short-term basis erode loyalty and respect for other workers. This occurs, as I tried to document in respect, in welfare state institutions run on the model of modern private enterprise. In the culture of the new capitalism, I explored the consequences for consumer culture, uh, that realm of fleeting, quickly junked goods, which parallels the work world. And I argued that, oddly enough, in our consumer culture, in its negligence for physical things, is dematerialized. Not a world of possession and a physical consciousness, but a world of fantasy goods. Finally, in the craftsman, I sought to explain the opposition of short-term labor to craftsmanship, a work ethos of doing things well for their own sake which is necessarily slow and painstaking. Short-term labor, chameleon institutions, and quickly junked consumption are poison to the first and most elemental condition of social ritual, the symbolic value of repeated action. You can make this concrete by thinking of modern, about modern attitudes towards institutional service. In the ethos of the consultant, long service to an organization has little value. Whereas in the life of a hospital cleaner, a mail clerk, or a salesman, service to an institution becomes a bonding ritual, both to the organization and to other workers. Long-term service is what they have to contribute. The experience of time raises a fundamental often misunderstood issue about ritual. We might equate ritual simply with a kind of conservative view of tradition. Uh, this equation is wrong, at least 
about secular ritual. In the work world, as in the city, rituals are created by those who practice them, and usually these are informal creations. The rituals of tea break, or covering for a fellow worker who screws up, as of civilities in the street. You'll not find these bonding behaviors written down in any organization chart or sitting planning document. Rather than align secular ritual with tradition, we would do better to align it with sustainability, which is to say, here are social behaviors which can carry people over the course of time, can surmount the flux and rough difficulties of everyday life. In the modern work world, as in the city, however, bureaucracy invades the parallel universe of informality. And when this invasion succeeds, the cons cultural consequences are a weak or a superfluous bond. Now this might seem to you a hopeless picture of modern culture, and I have my full share of middle European um, angst and uh, whatever it is. But I do, do not, in fact, believe that we are hopeless prisoners in what Max Weber called the iron cage of bureaucracy. Instead, it seems to me, modern culture has arrived at a condition our civilization has been at once before. That was a time when people believed that things could not go on as they had before. When change had to occur beneath the crust of political movering, maneuvering. When it seemed a fundamental shift in culture was urgent. That time was the Reformation. The historical Reformation was a religious moment of change. But not only that. From the early 18th century, to the, uh, from, excuse me, from the early 16th century to the early 17th century, Europe saw a flourishing of new technologies, mining, medicine, mechanical fabrication, which people did not know how to put to good social use. They improvised, and improvisation provide, uh, provided a fundamental energy for cultural creation. The historical reformation was again a time when migration to cities began to alter their character, with entire uprooted populations of Jews, Protestants, and peasants challenging the inward-looking character of established cities. Again, these oppressed groups improvised a life shared in common in a strange place. And the reformation was a time when labor began to cut free from the traditional medieval guild system. These newly freed workers not knowing how to relate to one another. Weber's Protestant ethic provided a glimpse of a small, self-obsessed elite. The mass had to look rather than within, also at one another. The historical reformation craved new tissues of connection new ritual bonds, but could not quite see their organized way forward. In both the desire for and the puzzle of relationship, the men and women of the Reformation are our ancestors. The idea of cultural reformation stands in contrast to the idea of Renaissance and of revolution. The literal meaning of Renaissance is rebirth. And in the case of the historical Renaissance, this meant the recovery of antiquity, Greek and Roman culture restoring life to the present. The idea of revolution is of the clean slate, the blank, fresh page. The idea hardly existed for our Reformation ancestors, <coughs> save in the form of revolt from below. Today, for better or worse, the dream of a blank slate is over. The idea of reformation looks forward in a different way from that of revolution. It emphasizes now, as did the historical reformation, 
the pain and confusion of lived experience, pain and confusion that cannot be washed away. I am a palimpsest, the philosopher Etienne de la Boitie declared. I contain every disappointment, and yet I have will. This was and is the spirit of reformation. It seeks in ritual one among many ways, a collective way, to countervail suffering, not to eliminate it. Today I would say that we need something like a new reformation on these terms. We need to reform work and place according to the canons of a more sustainable culture. The word reform has become a debased currency in politics. Certainly in our present circumstances at the moment in Britain, the word reform has simply come to mean ways of propping up the existing order. My own quarrel with this version of reform is rooted in my lifelong dialogue with Hannah Arendt. She argued to me that culture is the product of politics. And I've argued back, both when she was alive and after she died, that politics is at best a smudged mirror of everyday culture. Policy making is an exercise in fantasy so long as it does not reflect how people actually want to live. <coughs> Today in a complex society, we face the challenges of, desire, of how to desire to live with people who are not like ourselves, and how to desire to live more modestly in nature. These challenges we can meet, I believe, only by changes in values and belief. Cultural reformation only uh, can uh, put these into practice through improvisation and experiment. If reformation succeeds, we would then create new everyday rituals. Now perhaps this explains this emphasis that I have on culture as a driving force of, of change and on reformation as a model for the searching, deep-rooted kinds of cultural changes we need. Perhaps this explains why Archbishop Williams and I are appearing to you tonight on the same platform. Thank you very much. from Middle European angst to Celtic gloom. <laughs> but before elaborating on that, I would just like to say what a privilege it is to be part of this event and to be able to share my own profound appreciation of Richard's work, which I found rings so many bells for me in a rather different part of what we like to call the vineyard. <laughs> I want to begin with a phrase from the culture of the new capitalism, and that is Richard's definition of narrative movement. To believe in narrative movement is to believe that events in time connect, experience accumulates. Events in time connect, experience accumulates. Implicit in that is the idea that Narrative is something which synthesizes a whole range of transactions that happen in real time between real bodies. Because we think with matter. Ideas are embodied and enacted. We speak with things. And the transactions that we try to hold together when we tell a story about ourselves or about anything else, those transactions are material transactions. So if events in time connect and experience accumulates, 
That's a way of saying it's possible to connect material transactions, to read material transactions as making sense, that is, being capable of being communicated, being talked about. But behind that is, I think, a very significant assumption which takes us a little bit deeper. Events in time connect. Events in time are about material transactions. Material transactions can be made sense of. But material things are difficult. Material things resist. We begin to learn to think. It's sometimes been said, I'm slightly paraphrasing a rather more complicated French version of this. We begin to think when we bump into things. We learn to draw mental maps of our world by finding that bits of it don't give way when we walk into them. And we construct pictures of the world around those patterns of bumping, I'd say. Difficulty is part of human thinking. Something resists, but that resistance is not the end of the story. The resistance is at the same time, in some sense, something that draws us, invites or provokes. Something is there that is not absorbed or exhausted. And so thinking engages inevitably with difficulty. Thinking with things in the middle of things is bound to be a difficult business. And so narrative is a difficult business. And the significance of narrative in any account of what human thinking and therefore human society are all about is that it doesn't let us get away from that difficulty. Just be yourself, people say. Tell me about yourself. Let's start with something simple. But anyone who's ever had those things said to them knows painfully well that there is nothing more difficult than telling someone all about yourself. I am difficult to myself. Factus sum questio mihi, said St. Augustine. I become a question to myself. Just anyway, a little reminder that we didn't think of difficulty just in Paris in the 1970s. <laughs> I become a question to myself. Telling a story about myself, making a narrative of myself, is work, it's labor. And there's something about the constant repositioning involved in talking about myself that is a necessary reminder that narrative is an unfinished business. Some of you just might have come across a short story by George Mackay Brown, great Orkney poet and short story writer. It's called Brig of Dread. And it describes the experience of somebody wandering in a fog on a moorland trying to remember what his life has been about. You realize, of course, that eventually the story turns out to be to do with purgatory. He's not allowed out of the fog until he's got his story straight. <laughs> and you watch him recycling again and again, repeating in the malign sense, the versions of his story which keep him trapped, the versions of blame and responsibility that leave him absolutely stuck where he was. To move out of the fog, the story has to be retold. And this remarkable short story shows how just very, very slightly the walls begin to be breached and the retelling begins to become possible. And that, as I don't think I need to elaborate, is something that happens in the lives of collectivities as much as in the lives of individual psyches, but that's another story. I've mentioned St. Augustine, as people expect archbishops to do on occasions like this. <laughs> and having started on theology, I'll indulge myself with just a little aside on that to uh, pray in the message. I'm being very jargon-ridden tonight. Um, and that's simply a reminder that, of course, yes, faith has to do with narrative, personal narrative. And I belong to a tradition of faith to which narrative is central. If you open the New Testament, you'll find the first things in it are narratives, not creeds or sets of ideas. 
But the rather curious thing is that there are four narratives covering the same ground. There is a dimension of Christianity which acknowledges the difficulty of narrative by the mere fact of having four versions of the same events to start you off. Four versions which, if you look at them, of course, do not always say the same thing by any means. As if in that initial, that generative story, there is an element of having to say there's something here that has not yet been mastered and we can only start again. The last words of St. John's Gospel memorably put it, if I were to try and write down everything, the world would not contain the books that could be written. So the dimension that relates narrative to faith is indeed, as Richard hinted, an important one. Faith, surprisingly, builds into itself some recognition of difficulty. Because if you don't recognize at some level that talking about God is difficult, then it's rather doubtful whether faith is what you're involved in at all. And the difference from ordinary social ritual and narrative involved in religious practice is, I suppose, simply in saying that what's given you as the difficult donne, the difficult agenda you've got to work with, is more than just an environment and more than just the sum of other human narratives. But there is an element of narrative, I would dare to say, though this takes me a bit beyond my brief, an element of narrative which is always uncomfortably going to push you towards questions about transcendence because you have to think about what exactly it is that is not exhausted in the difficult things you are wrestling with. But moving back to the central issue, one of the things which I valued most particularly in Richard's last three or four books has been the sketch that he offers of what human experience looks like without difficulty. What happens to the human imagination and the human self-image when the ideal is presented as a world without traction or friction? Difficulty, you might say, is being reconceived as hostility. Difficulty is what is there to be overcome, not to be engaged with, not to be encountered as something which changes or enlarges. Readers of um, some journals from the 60s may recall that wonderful um, essay on the French uh, philosophical movement known as Resistentialism, whose uh, maxim was les choses sont contre nous. It was an explanation, a philosophical explanation of why toast always falls but it's side down. <laughs> Things are against us. Difficulty is hostility. Difficulty is to be overcome, which implies in turn, of course, that the ideal state of human existence is that frictionless, undifferentiated time and place where we meet no resistance. And I say undifferentiated, undifferentiated time and place because the facts of the past and the facts of the present are the resistance with which we work. If we don't, if we no longer find those resistant or difficult, we are in that frictionless, timeless, placeless reality, which for those formed in an older humanist tradition, and I'm using humanist in the proper sense, um, feels like a recipe for boredom and self-enclosure. I think that, and I want to talk about the Reformation with you in a minute, Richard, okay. but one of the downsides of the Reformation was a certain impatience with sacred time, a certain impatience with the difficulty of what had gone on between the beginnings of Christianity and the present day. The Reformation at its most marked and extreme was an attempt to wipe out that long mediating period in which ideas and therefore material transactions had shaped and reshaped perception. It also had a little bit to do with the fact that some people had very sensibly noted that people were having too many days off for religious holidays and this was not doing the economy any good. <laughs> that 
Impatience with sacred time does go alongside, however, this is the gain of the Reformation, on which I'd rather agree, it goes alongside a deeper engagement with the simple outlines of the sacred narrative and a creative retelling of origins. Somebody like Calvin is fascinating because actually he doesn't simply wipe out the intervening centuries. He offers a retelling of the great story which opens up new possibilities. And he offers it precisely as an urban, post-Renaissance humanist. Not the first words you normally associate with Calvin, but Calvin was not a Scot. It's important to remember that. <laughs> it also, I think, delivers people, this particular Reformation story, delivers them from an anxiety about ritual. One of the things that people clearly felt by the end of the Middle Ages, it's what you read in Heitzinger and in people like that, is the sense that the world is now so crowded with ritual that you are stifled and anxiety is your state of being. The terrible consequences of missing the symbolism, missing the messages, increasingly closes off innovation and creativity and a sense of at-homeness in the world. It actually has the opposite effect to what ritual ought to have. Instead of anchoring you, it alienates you from almost everything. And that's the sense you have as you look at that fantastically over-elaborated late medieval world of symbol, allegory, and so forth. However, as I've said, the Reformation does have its downside, and you can see the modern evolution of global consciousness and global capital as completing a certain logic about undifferentiated time and space. You can see how the deep Reformation suspicion of an exaggerated reverence for sacred time works itself through into an attitude to time where punctuation, what you might call the sabbatical principle, that is, that you take a day off from time to time, where that has disappeared because as time zones blend into each other in a global communications environment, there are no natural rhythms into which you can fit and time becomes a flat surface, if I can mix my metaphors thoroughly. And one of the questions which I find put most sharply, most interestingly in Richard's recent work is precisely how we restore the possibilities of punctuated time. Time, that is, where you're not primarily involved in self-justifying or self-promoting. Time where there is some opportunity to look at what it is that we have to engage with. You might almost say time to work on our stories. And I don't mean time to work on our resumes. <laughs> time to look at what has made us what we are. And that is indeed the question which I think we've already been led to this evening, the question about what the scope and scale is of human communities and human interactions that allows that kind of punctuation, that kind of properly episodic approach to our time to emerge, given that the global climate of global capital and global communication is not friendly to this, and that this has certain results in producing a kind of human being who has no opportunity to examine the story, no opportunity to get their story straight, you might say. Again, just in the margin, rather, I can't be alone, I'm sure, in finding very curious the reappropriation and reinvention, perhaps in the last, say, 15 years in the UK, of Remembrance Day. I grew up in a context where Remembrance Day was still a real, literal remembering for a great many people of the Second World War. As I grew older, I moved into an environment where it was taken for granted that that was something rapidly dissolving in the consciousness of the culture. And I watched during the 90s, not least, of course, with the anniversary of the end of World War II 
1995, I watched the reinvention of Remembrance Day as a different kind of storytelling and community affirmation and watched it rerouting itself in the lives of some very um, deprived communities in southeast Wales where I was then working, which you wouldn't at all have associated with some of the classical locations of the celebration of Remembrance Day. And I wondered then, and I wonder now, about the need for punctuating ceremony and the retelling of stories, noting that the way in which it was reappropriated was not, rather surprisingly, in a nationalistic rhetoric, but strangely in a local one. It was a celebration of barely remembered, but still what you could call traditioned, recollections of solidarity and even corporate idealism. And it became again, in some of those circles, a popular and meaningful thing. And that says something about narrative and ritual and scope and scale, I think in the way that Richards encouraged us to, to reflect. So finally, we're being invited, I think, here to look at the whole task of meaning. Meaning as engaging with the difficulty of material interaction. Meaning as something which requires a particular human scale to the environment we're in. And what does that mean in the urban context? How does it realize itself? And I just want to finish with a sideways glance at a subject I know is dear to Richard's heart and that of some others here. But simply to notice that, of course, music is one of the forms in which narrative and ritual habitually and familiarly come together. And I do rather wonder whether the answer to some of our social ills is that we don't make social music. <laughs> I don't by that mean necessarily that everybody ought to join string quartets, <laughs> though there are worse fates. But it's not a bad point of intersection, perhaps, for thinking about countervailing suffering without eliminating it, and thinking about rituals that bind strangers, and about activities that are irreducibly and necessarily bound up with time-taking and, indeed, difficulty. Thank you. Richard, to comment. Your, your view on the Reformation was somewhat challenged, but you may want to pick up other points. Uh, no, actually, on something else. Uh, can you hear? Is, is that all right? Um, I think the interesting intersection between, in social terms, between uh, ritual and narrative is this issue of difficulty. What can said about informal rituals at work, kind of thing to be a nice study. It's not written down that people can try ways of just getting through the day or the month or the year. It's often said about these that these actually reduce difficulties. It's often said about routines in public in cities that what they do is they, they lower the temperature as Lewis Mumford once said about urban culture, that you help people get along by lowering the temperature. I actually think this is wrong. It makes us too much into uh, you know, merely sort of guinea pigs whose desire is to feel very little. Um, the kinds of organization of time that's punctuated in this rhythm which is what ritual does. 
It was a way of looking forward to sustaining, I would think, in the longer time, a more open mm -hmm. narrative. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of sympathy with that. I think the, the word sustainability is one I warm to a yeah. lot in, in what you were saying earlier. And I think it would be quite wrong to see ritual as, as a form of denial, which is almost what, right. what's being uh, said. Uh. Ritual gives you um, certain ways of, of containing conflict, but that doesn't mean necessarily softening it. It gives you um, some space in which the conflict isn't the only thing that defines you and therefore allows something to move in what can otherwise be a standoff. Somebody once described um, an activity, I, I think it's um, from an anthropological study of shamanism in Central America, the tribal shaman drawing a circle into which yeah. he summons mm. the conflicted parties. Not to deny the conflict, but to say this is the place where you, you actually think about it harder or deal with it at some yeah. other level. And I think ritual has, has an element of that in it. It's not, therefore, um, a making easy. And I, th I, I think you're right that the Mumford approach is, is a bit reductive in that way. It is. Uh, but it also, don't you think, Rowan, it also expresses a kind of deep felt uh, modern need that fulfillment lies in something that's some version of user friendly. Mm -hmm. um, I've thought a lot about this, you know, in terms of technology. Why do we want to make machines easy to use? Well, for some machines, we have to do that. But in others, we can only get to know the machine by being able to expose what's inside it. Mm. And what's inside it may make it slower and more difficult to use. And I'd say the same thing is probably true in our social lives. Mm -hmm. That the kind, there's a deep, and this is cultural, there's a deep vested interest in relieving friction. Mm. Yeah. No, it's I, almost I, sessile, you know yes, what I mean? Yes, like I do. Coming, coming to a deadly coming rest. A stop. But I wonder how much that's got to do with certain historic developments in, in how we see the self. Um, and as you were talking, I thought of the, the agent and the machine. Um, as a pair with a very clear boundary between them. The, the agent is here using brain and will. Commands are transferred, the machine operates. And picking up your arguments about the craftsman, of course the boundaries are, are more fluid in a sense. There, there's a sense in which the tool has to become an extension of the body, in which the the flow of meaning right. into what's done, what's made, blurs that boundary. Something is an extension of self. Is that? But I think this sense? is a, a maybe philosophical difference between us because my notion of becoming a good craftsman is getting outside oneself by becoming more yeah. limited with being within that circle. Your notion of narrative is one of not merely not knowing what comes next, but in that not knowing a certain kind of transcendence, mm -hmm. which is undefined mm -hmm. and undefinable and takes you yeah. to faith. Yeah. These are two very different ways about looking at definition and closure. Mm -hmm. My sense is for you, narrative is an unclosing. And for me, craftsmanship is a kind of objectification which is, which is bounded. Now, it has a kind of modesty to it. It yeah. has an ethics. I know how to bake bread. Mm. I used to know how to play the cello well. You know, That's a defined thing. It's not myself. It's in the object. Mm. But when I read your Dostoevsky book, I had the feeling that for you, the unbinding of narrative always taking you to a place which has no definition. And that's where faith begins. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm misreading. No, that's, that's very interesting. And I, I have to give rather a lot of thought yeah. to... We go on like this, by the way. <laughs> 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 Bear with us. You know, we need some pleasure. <laughs>
true. Um, but I'd, I'd say also that when the craftsman has submitted, become external, objectified, or rather when the work has become objectified right. in that way, that in turn becomes an agenda, it becomes a bit of a surprise, it becomes another donne, another source of difficulty. Right. I and, agree. and pushes the narrative further on. Right. So there's still not closure in a straightforward sense. I mean, I guess True. that a lot of artists as well as craftspeople would say, um, that's what I made. Now I have to try and understand it. Right. Or another way to look at it, this is more true of musical craft, is, well, I did it, hmm. but it wasn't good enough. And so I have to sure, repeat yes. it. Yes. Yes. It's not so much to understand, and that's where the, and that's where the rituals of performing, mm -hmm. I th think in the craftsman, I mean, I think the craftsman's world is not a world that leads to religious belief in that sense. Mm -hmm. Not because craftsmen aren't religious, mm -hmm. but because there's always this notion of the limit, uh, which requires a repetition mm -hmm. and requires a kind of ritual to mm -hmm. organize going on from one, one damn concert to the next, to the next, to the next, you know? One book from the next to the next mm -hmm. to the next. Would you say that's true of the kind of narratives that you're interested in? I don't see quite such a... Four such Gospels a require 40? Mm. Well, yes. I think, just as Freud said, the, the good analysis terminates when you know it could go on forever. Maybe, yes, that's true. maybe by the end of the fourth <laughs> gospel, you think, okay, I've got Enough. the point. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's maybe a theological argument. But I'm not sure there's quite such a, a gulf here in that the repetition of the craftsman, it's not simply a hamster going around on the wheel, is it? It's not no, simply, no, it's a metamorphosis. It's a metamorphosis all the time. And the next enactment of the craft is going to be different. It's going to be different partly because of the last enactment. Something's learned, something's made, something's out there that wasn't. That's, that's the openness right. I think I'm but digging Let for. me put this to you another way. Do you think that faith is a form of craft? <laughs> I'd say that quite a bit of religious practice is a form of craft, yes. But I mean faith. Yes, faith. You'd have to say a bit more about no, that. No, you can't, you, can't, you can't crawl on it. <laughs> Do you think the act of believing is something that we gave, give the same kind of shaping to? Right. That we would right. give, a, to come back to your last mm. analogy, mm. to a musical a music. phrase? Yes, it is. And that doesn't it's mean, you know, I make it up any more than I make right. up the world I work on. Right. That's As really interesting. interesting. I think... There is a, a rather, un, to me, unhelpful model of faith which just says, um, how can I be wrong if I'm so sincere, you know, it, right, it's just, yeah, which, which is not yeah. what it's about, nor what people sometimes call blind faith. And they say, well, I've just decided to do it this way. You're trying to come to terms with a difficulty that's posed, right. I think, as, as a person of faith. That's you know, the, the biggest difficulty, intellectual or moral, you could imagine, which yeah. is God. Should we uh, bring in the congregation? Sorry, the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, at this point. And, um, I mean, I don't think you need to be disciplined with very pointed questions, but uh, we're very happy to take any comments or questions at this point. Yeah, someone right in the middle at the back. Can you... Uh, yeah. And sort of a white shirt, hand up. We'll take, we'll take two or three comments and then come back to. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm a little disconcerted to be going first. Um, something I'm struggling with, uh, with both speakers, um, is around this uh, difficulty and ease. And I'm, I'm wondering around difficulty and ease. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering where I've gone wrong, and I'll make these statements, and I want to hear uh, what I'm missing. Um, for Professor Sennett, it's uh, around, uh, I guess, the ease of um, quick consumption and discarding. 
uh, could that not be a ritual of some kind? And um, I guess similarly, and this comes from a, a position of um, fairly unknowing, um, unsophisticated, unsophisticated views of religion for um, the Archbishop, of uh, would imagining a place where the, the lion and the lamb can lay down together, um, is that in a sense meaningless? Um, because the difficulty, um, at least in uh, the cliched form of, of how the lion and the lamb relate together, that difficulty is no longer there. Um, and thus there may no, be no narrative. There may, need, there may be no difficulty. And thus is it meaningless. And obviously the um, implications for heaven, um, there are some in there. So I'm wondering what I'm missing. Um, I'm not trying to give a, a crude uh, criticism of either Professor Senate or the Archbishop. I'm wanting to know what I'm missing here. Thank you. Well, you didn't need to apologize for, for starting with that uh, fascinating question. Yeah, take a full throw here. We'll take three and then come back to the uh, Hello there. I was just wondering whether either of you were attracted by the romantic idea of the fragment here, a system of thought or narrative that both is complete but also advertises its incompleteness by being, being a fragment. It makes sense of things but omits the incompleteness and then leaves space for new connections. Mm. There was someone else I saw, oh, yes, uh, in the middle there, yeah. Uh, I have a question to His Grace, uh, who is uh, a specialist in uh, Russian Orthodox uh, Christian philosophy, and I'm wondering what he thinks and how he thinks uh, the fact that the Orthodox Church is being outside the reformist and the Renaissance uh, influences, how is it reflected in the uh, Russian Orthodox narrative and ritual? Thank you. Thank you. I think there was just one more there, just right behind you, and then we'll come back. Um, it, it strikes me that the nature of craft, to some degree, is the relationship of the craftsperson with the tool. And it, it sort of occurs to me that there's been some lamenting the loss of craftsmanship. And I think that there's, a, to some degree, a misunderstanding of the nature of new tools as they come along. Um, Mr. Sennett's uh, made an interesting point, I think, in your craftsman book, when you spoke about an architect um, drawing with a CAD system, a computer. Um, I would like you to comment on this a little bit more, but it, it strikes me that actually it's really the type of uh, tool that you're really taught and that you're really uh, familiar with that actually becomes the tool that, which can express your craft. It's not something that's been lost, it's just something that's being uh, transformed in that sense. Archbishop, you want to first go? Um. Well, uh, four fantastic questions, actually. Um, perhaps I can have a go at two of them. And that sounds fair. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to negotiate. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, the first question about difficulty and ease, and I'll, I'll take the question that was put to me about the lion and the lamb. I find that very challenging because I think a great deal of... Um, traditional religious language about heaven and aspiration for heaven is a bit like the aspiration for the frictionless reality. I think it's been noticed by some um, Christian writers, I can't speak for others over the centuries, in, um, for example, people like the 4th century uh, Greek writer Gregory of Nyssa, um, when he talks about the fact that there is, um, even outside the circumstances of this life, an endless incompleteness because there is always something we will be moving into if we take the infinity of God seriously. So, um, you know, the lion and the lamb may be lying down together, but they may still be having quite difficult conversations. <laughs> <laughs> As it were. You know, it's, it's not that... <laughs> slightly, um, slightly strained on the lamb's part, I'm sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I do think that there's a, a serious element there within some strands of the religious discourse that would want to avoid just that temptation, while there are others that, of course, are all about frictionlessness. Um, 
be interesting, wouldn't it? Though I'm not suggesting we do it now. It'd be interesting to read Dante's Paradiso with that in mind. Because when I read Dante, I don't really have the impression that he's talking about a static, frictionless reality. That there's, there's edge in his heaven somewhere. But that, that's a long story. Um, and I was asked a very specific question about the Orthodox Church and its historical and cultural location outside Renaissance and Reformation. To me, what, that's part of what makes the world of Russian religious philosophy of the 19th and early 20th century so very fascinating. Here is an intellectual world which has not gone through the recovery of the classics that happened in the Western Renaissance, which therefore isn't necessarily starting from the idea that um, philosophy began, went into a long decline, and started again with John Locke, let's say. It's, um, it's a philosophy which is deeply marked, of course, by Hegel, and uses Hegel to think through the reality of a very conflicted society, and finds in Hegel's own, um, well, as, as it's read in Russia, indeterminacy, even more in Schelling, some kind of convergence with an Eastern Christian tradition of moving into indeterminacy, the difficulty of talking about God. And so there's a sense in which the, the great Russian writers from Kiryevsky, say in the middle of the 19th century onwards, are doing something much more um, adventurous than Western philosoph philosophers of a century earlier. I'm not saying better or worse, but certainly adventurous. In saying, well, we've got to think why society has been through this vastly conflicted history, and actually it helps to think of conflict, of dialectic, as the way in which we move into the endless mystery of creativity. Now, you get that at its most extreme, and I think it's most waffly, in Berdyaev, yeah. for whom I increasingly don't have that much time. That's just um, guff, a lot of it. Yeah. You get it much more seriously, I'd say, in Bulgakov's attempt to think himself out of Marxism and into Christianity. But I won't give a lecture on all that. That's just a response to a very, very fascinating question. Richard, you have... Fragments and computer-aided software. Um, <laughs> We'd have Russians as well, if you like. Uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, I, well, you've taken my question. That's right. But you've, you've answered it much more brilliantly than I, I ever could. Uh, uh, well, we'll come back to that. I wanted to say about your, your question about the fragment that uh, it may be able to explain why I'm so... I'm, so interested in uh, ritual. Then I had this very rough passage in my, in my own biography from leaving music to going into social science, and if I'd only known, <laughs> there were other possible paths. But one thing that uh, really struck me was that some of the means of uh, the craft work of making music might apply to social relations. And the most primary of that was, was for me, uh, the itch, issue of rituals of performing. You can see it in what my work became. But there's a large uh, fly in that ointment, which is that a lot of the music I was performing, Schumann, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Debussy, and then a lot of Bartok, uh, my performing guest, was all about the fragment. And I wouldn't say it's just romantic. I would say that the whole aesthetic tenor of, of a great deal of modern, uh, what we think of as modern movement, is about the value of fragmentary. And in my mind, all these years, there's been a question, what is the relation between that value of the fragment, the interruption, the, fra the tear, uh, and 
the means of expressing to others, which require ritual, order, and encasing of fragments in something that moves forward in time. Almost every pianist, for instance, who plays Schumann, think of a piece that, a piece that you all would know, like Carnival, is almost pushed to the point of suicide about how to give a narrative shape to these fragments and how to contrive the rituals of performance that activate our memory. This is something we haven't talked about, mm. is the role of memory uh, bridging narrative rituals. Well, any musician here, will, classical musician, will know that. Is there some analog in the social world? I think there is. Uh, that in some way we're always struggling with the difficulty, if you like, of pushing the fragmentary into a longer f uh, point of, a longer experience of time. And uh, I've seen workers do this when I've uh, interviewed unemployed workers who will take the moment when they were fired or the moment of cleaning out their desks and putting them into cardboard boxes. When you talk to them five years later, that fragment becomes an ordinary, it becomes a kind of orientating way of explaining rhythms that occurred ever after <coughs> in life. That's how people think about something as prosaic, if you like, as being fire. That has a quality in which narrative fragment <coughs> and rhythm are, are mediated with each, each other. I'd be curious to know what you think about that. I was thinking about the way in which pre-modern art can deliberately bring in interruption to signal something about um, incompletion. The, the missing note in um, Bach's Magnificat at the end. Yeah, of the, yeah, uh, so wonderful. You know? uh, by intention, Demis Demis intention Demis or accident? Intention. He's cool. a clever old son. <laughs> he was a clever old son. Um, or again, the way in which George Herbert, in one or two of his poems, deliberately stops halfway through the line, as if to say, that's all you're getting. Think, you know. Right. You're, you're left with it. But that's different from the fragment, isn't it? Because. Right. That's an this, absence. Which yes, is it's an absence. The fragment, if you like, cr configures the absence by like, coming at it from all around. It's not just a flow which has a, a single break. Yeah. It's something else. Um, but what, what you were saying about pushing the fragmentary or the fragmenting experience into the longer experience of time, yes and yes again, because I think that, that is the, the social challenge. We were together the other night um, at another event, and I think I, I quoted um, something about how British history is actually a series of unsuccessful invasions and incomplete conquests, and we're always trying to tell a story of um, fragmented national yeah. experience and pretending it's a single one. But sorry, I could go on with that too. Yeah, yeah. There are other questions. <laughs> sure. Let's, uh, let's take a couple of other uh, comments and then before we, before we wind up, one down here. I, w I was very struck by the Archbishop's remarks about Remembrance Sunday, and my question is really, or my comment is about ritual degenerating into routine, and then routine being ah. elevated back into ritual. And um, I just wonder that if the healing process of Remembrance Sunday uh, and the way that the healing continued, and then of course we're back in major wars with coffins coming home, it's almost as if the wound has been reopened and uh, the healing process is, is, without in any way being contemptuous at all, has been reinvigorated. And can I just make two further brief comments and, and related to that? One is, I remember my grandparents taking me to the Church of Scotland as a Calvinist uh, in uh, the 1950s and 60s, and it was routine. And certainly for a small boy like me, it was routine. And yet, of course, in the crisis of their lives and others, it becomes a much more meaningful ritual. 
And similarly, over the last few weeks, we might see politics perhaps as a routine or parliamentary, parliamentary activity as a routine, and then we suddenly find ourselves in the ritual of a general re election, which perhaps reinvigorates our politics. Uh, we'll just uh, we'll rise up on the... Uh... This is catnip. <laughs> um, one thing was, was, was occurring to me as you were talking. Um, uh, I have a daughter who's just doing her finals in architecture at the moment. And um, the issue around the three-dimensional three aspects of uh, building and, and models that, mm. that are made compared to however sophisticated a CAD you, you use, there is this three-dimensionality to that architecture and to that process of, of craftsmanship that's developed in them. And it made me think about the difference, in a sense, between the narrative and the ritual issue, um, that ritual is, is engaging the senses in a way that narrative doesn't. Now, I'm not saying that narrative doesn't engage the senses, but there is a different engagement. And it seems to me to be a lot around touch. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I was intrigued by the uh, re reference to events capable of being talked about because um, in the modern world with ritual disappearing you can't spot where people depart from ritual I mean, even sort of, uh, stand up comics are finding it harder to find people to make fun of because everybody is uh, Nobody has characteristics that stand out in any way. Am I right or wrong? Thank you. Uh, there was one other person just... Uh, yeah, just we'll take that last one, thanks. Um, Richard's question to Rowan as to whether faith is a craft. And I was wondering in a different way whether or how we think of loving as a craft in a way that opens up not a difference between you, but certainly a question. That for Richard, the notion of craft and the meaning of craft can be read as an alternative to faith. That is, meaning and purpose comes through a certain kind of skill and capacity which we know through craft. But it's different from the craft. It, it, there's a way in which the notion of the self um, gets somehow lost, because the idea is to somehow escape from the self. And I'm thinking just briefly of Simone Weil's notion she has the example of difficulty, which I've certainly learned from. The notion of difficulty for her is the image of the sculptor who faces this block, and it's through that difficulty or confrontation that the self is in some way both involved in a craft, but also in a practice of care and love. So Thanks. that's my question. Yeah. Well, let, let's, uh, I'm going to give the Archbishop again, and then Richard gets the final word. To, it's his day. <laughs> Loving as a craft. Um, I, I think having read Simone Weil as well and been very marked by what she says, I would go along with that. I, I think here, of course, of Gillian Rose's great Love's Work as, as a text on that subject. Um, love as learning how to fail in the face of what, what won't go away. Um, and I, yes, the whole notion that the self in the craft that has a discipline, the self is rebuffed, challenged, put in perspective, transformed in the engagement. What's there in front of you is not what you chose. Get used to it. Grow with it. You know that that's that's part of that. So loving as a craft, yes, and 
the um, phrase which actually is used in some of the spiritual literature that prayer is the, the art of arts means, of course, it's the craft of crafts, because that is supremely something where you didn't choose this, get used to it, grow with it, is, is the agenda. Um, very quickly, um, ritual, routine, ritual, that cycle, absolutely yes. Um, ritual comes alive in times of crisis, personally and corporately. It's why there's this extraordinary search for ritual expression in times of trauma, the bunches of flowers at the site of the accident thing. Um, and a story I've often told, when in my diocese in Wales years ago, a particularly traumatic murder on a council estate in Cardiff um, of a schoolgirl, and the local priest meeting some schoolchildren on the street, talking to them and saying, casually, how would it be if I left the church open for an hour or two on Friday night? And being astonished to find 80 or so teenagers coming and lighting candles. And the lighting of candles as, as a routine, what you do when you go to church on Sunday, is something quite different. Something's been rediscovered there, very definitely. Um, and three-dimensionality, I'll leave that mostly to Richard, I think, but just note about um, engaging the senses. I entirely take the point about touch, but I do think that narrative as performance can in its way engage the senses as well, and drama as a form of narrative is, is sensual in a high degree. And I think we shouldn't underrate the oral performance assault on the senses that powerful narrative can construct. And I, again, very much resonate with the difficulty of not being able to spot where the incongruities are. I've occasionally said that you can't actually have a sense of humour unless you've got a metaphysic, in that you don't actually know what's funny <laughs> um, if there isn't a world <laughs> up there somewhere. And that, that, that is one of the difficulties. I, I feel in honour bound to say that um, given the uh, Church of England and its present leadership, I think stand-up comics and impressionists still have some work. <laughs> That's a very nice... Uh, well, we won't go further, at the so. um, Well, I just want to say two, two very brief things, and, and then thank you all for this wonderful day. The two brief things are that um, one of the worst things in the world we can do to ourselves is fear routine, indeed fear being bored. For most people, this is uh, an event that we have to, being bored, doing routine things, is something that um, we have to endure. Uh, it's, it's there. I think routine actually, actually has a much uh, more positive, uh, can have a much more positive role. Uh, particularly when they're routines that we make ourselves. When in music, uh, believe me, after an hour and a half of practicing scales, you, you are not involved in you know, the deep, you know, the deep metaphysical you know, uh, depths. There is a pleasure in it simply because it's become something that you're making happen and uh, that you're living within the variations of routine. The problem in modern society is that we don't have routines of that sort that you can dig into. They're imposed. Uh, they're completely arrhythmic in the sense that they simply repeat again and again and again. And when I wrote the Craftsman book, I, I wanted to get away from the notion, the romantic notion we might have of craftsmanship as something where, which is very self-expressive. You know? It isn't. It's something in which out of these ordinary materials of everyday life, just doing the same thing again and again, gradually take a kind of appropriation uh, and you begin to give them a shape. And that's something that takes you outside of yourself and in, into the world. Um, and I, 
you know, the way I think about that, about all my uh, work in social philosophy, my work in, uh, in cities, and certainly my studies of labor, uh, for me, the point is not uh, self-fulfillment or self-expression, but somebody that something rather processes that liberate people to objectify, to get involved in something other than themselves. And I suppose if I have an ethical point of view, it's all about that. How do you be in the world rather than inside yourself? And routine is a way to do that. It's one of the essential ingredients of doing that. Anyhow, I'd like to conclude this evening by thanking you, particularly those of you who have endured nearly eight hours <laughs> to talk uh, for, for coming. This has been great for me. Uh, I've learned an enormous amount. Uh, and um, I hope to have a long continued association uh, with you. As I say, to argue, preferably also to have the odd glass of red wine, which I think we also might do now. So thank you very much for this event. <laughs>